for guys who don't know, this is right in your wheelhouse. We talk a lot about Rift and Quartered. Um, can you give a quick explanation on how Rift and Quartered is different and what the advantages of Rift and Quartered are? Yeah, I actually brought some uh, little handy dandy. Oh, nice. We got we our got marketing department. I, I'm no Vanna White, but I'm going to go ahead and show this to you. <laughs> so. This is uh this is exactly how, this is why they call it a quarter sign. You're quartering the log into four four pie shapes. So what you get is we take this pie this section of the pie, and you make your first cut this way, rotate the the pie, make your next cut this way, rotate it back, cut it this way. And what that's doing is you can see the annual rings on the first section or the first cut or at 90 degrees uh -huh. as you get closer and that's your quarter boards that's where you tend to get your quarter your heavy quarter gotcha. as you get closer to the middle you can see the the annual rings on these boards down here if i'm close enough we'll start to get yep. more into the 30 to 60 degree rings that's where you get your riffs on gotcha. this is this is something that uh the quarter versus the rift grade is is something that the contractors really need to stress the grading rules with their customers is what yep. you'll learn to is somebody will say, I want a hundred percent quartered floor. We say, we'll give you a hundred percent quartered floor based on the grading rule, which the grading yep. rule is 50% of each piece has to have the quartered flag. Now, the wider you go, the more quarter you're going to get. That's why getting riffs on in wide boards, this is a great way to explain to them why it's so expensive. You have to have a really, really big log in order to get because your quarter boards are your first cuts. So you got to get this annual ring to start to turn. Yeah. Well, you can see these boards are getting more and more narrow out here. And that's why a rift only in a seven or eight inch is very, very difficult to get. Uh, because Interesting. You, start, you need to start with a much bigger log in order to maintain the width of the boards as you're cutting them off and get out here where the annual rings turn. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. I sure. A lot of you guys out there know uh, Graf. If you've been installing installing wood floors for any appreciable amount of time, you've probably come across and put down some Graf products. So welcome, John. Why don't you uh, give us a quick introduction um, for those of you who don't know, uh, or those guys who don't know you, John, and then tell us a little bit about Graf. Well, I'm John Nichols. I've been with uh, Graf for 20 years now. We uh, We've been in the flooring business the entire time. We uh, separated uh, a few few years ago back with uh, from Graf Brothers. So a lot of people know me from my days there. And even uh, many, many years ago when I was with Taylor Lumber, uh, mm -hmm. the Graf family has been, uh, has been in this business for, I'd say, 40, 50 years uh, in various things between logs, lumber, uh, flooring started back probably in the mid nineties, early nineties. Um, basically That's we make, you know, solid engineered products. Awesome. So you guys are, are solid and engineered. Most, uh, probably most contractors out there or distributors or whoever, most people in the flooring business know you guys because of your rift and quartered. Um, yeah. but you guys have, you know, a whole host of products. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about, I think both your solid and your engineered, flooring today so um why don't you just give us a quick run through kind of species with um pattern floors kind of what do you guys do like what do you provide uh what's the spectrum of products you provide all right uh so basically we do solid and engineered uh the species mix is red oak white oak walnut and hickory uh, okay the what we're known for is the rifting quarter song, uh, but we offer live song, plain song, uh, a variety of different things you can do with those. Uh, we, the solid flooring, we do from three inch up to 11 and a half inch, some two and a quarter, but we're not really a strip mill, so we don't do a, a huge volume of the, of the two and a quarter. Uh, engineered, also two and a quarter up to 11 and a half inches. Uh, different platforms are five eighths uh, with a four millimeter wear layer, three quarter with a four millimeter wear layer, 
or you can do a three quarter with a six millimeter order layer for those guys that want a little bit more meat on the top. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so, uh, real quickly for guys who don't know, can you touch on what live song is? Yeah, live song is, is a kind of a European, uh, type product that's that's made its way here in the last become real popular in the last oh i'd say three to five years hard to pinpoint when that really happened but basically it's a senate that there's two kind of thoughts on this and i always like to clarify when i'm talking to somebody what they mean by live song what we mean by live song is it's a center cut plane song so that the cathedral brain kind of goes up the middle of the plank Mm -hmm. You know, typically you need to be at roughly seven inches or wider to really get the look properly. Uh, mm -hmm. What that does is it centers the grain up and then on the edges of the board, you end up getting like a riff song, maybe some slight quarter sawing on the sides, but mostly they, they're looking for the rift edges, the center cut cathedral. Gotcha. Uh, and uh, the grades vary. A lot of the stuff from Europe tends to be just character grades i mean you can get you can get select and better but it uh it's really pricey going that way and what we try to do is is offer all the grades select character one common well we're a family of business so we can kind of tailor it to your needs gotcha okay um and then i assume you know with all the species you talked about you guys provide pretty standard grades select one common two common and that that spectrum but when we get to like a character grade what would you explain to a contractor is in the character grade in terms of, you know, the mix of, of defects and stuff? What, what could they expect on that? If you're looking for, if you want to buy something just straight out of stock, uh, we, we put it up usually as select and character. And the mm -hmm. character grade tends to run about 75% of that bundle or that floor would fall into maybe a one common category. 25% mm -hmm. roughly would fall into what would be a two common category. But since we put it up as a one to 10 product, you may find a board is, let's say 10 foot long. The first two feet would fall into a two common, the middle might fall into a one common, and then the last two feet might be select. So it's, that's how we achieve the, the longer plank. If you just, yeah. build, you know, a lot of those boards aren't going to be too common from, from start to finish on that board. It's, it's more of a, it's almost like a middle run, except we, we in match it for you and, and make sure that, any major defects, like holes all the way through the board or out. Gotcha. Yeah, I think that's um, something that I've explained a lot to contractors to realize like, hey, when a board is coming through at a mill, you may have a, a 10 foot long board um, because the lumber is 10 foot long. And in that 10 foot long board, you have a little bit of, of character in the board. As soon as you chop that out to make select pieces, now you've shortened all your lengths way down. So it's also a way of, um, you know, including the character in the floor is a way of extending the lengths on the floor as well. So, sure. Well, another yeah. thing we, we offer is, is for the guy that wants something, an upgrade, doesn't just want, so it's like a standard one to 10 foot product on a character is going to roughly average around four foot, give or take a little bit. That's going to be your average board length. Yeah, we can offer three and longer, four and longer, five and longer, six and longer. Pretty much if you give us the spec on those things, we can do it. And, and you're, average length goes up exponentially the more you lessen the, the minimum length gotcha yep so uh you know for guys who don't know this is right in your wheelhouse we talk a lot about rift and quartered um can you give a quick explanation on how rift and quartered is different and what the advantages of rift and quartered are yeah i actually brought some uh, little handy dandy oh nice we got we got a marketing I, I'm no van of white, but I'm going to go ahead and share this to you. <laughs> so this is, uh, this is exactly how, this is why they call it quarter sign. You're quartering the log into four, four pie shapes. So what you get is we take this pie, this section of the pie, and you make your first cut this way, rotate the, the pie, make your next cut this way, rotate it back, cut it this way. And what that's doing is you can see the annual rings on the first section or the first cut are at 90 degrees. Uh -huh. As you get closer, and that's your quarter boards. That's where you tend to get your quarter, your heavy quarter. Gotcha. As you get closer to the middle, you can see the 
the annual rings on these boards down here, if I'm close enough, will start to get yep. more into the 30 to 60 degree range. That's where you get your riffs on. Gotcha. This is, this is something that uh, the quarter versus the rift grade is, is something that the contractors really need to stress the grading rules with their customers. Is what yep. you'll run into is somebody will say, I want a 100% quartered floor. We say, we'll give you a 100% quartered floor based on the grading rule, which the grading yep. rule is 50% of each piece has to have the quartered flag. Now, the wider you go, the more quartered you're going to get. That's why getting riffs on in wide boards, this is a great way to explain to them why it's so expensive. You have to have a really, really big log in order to get because your quarter boards are your first cuts. So you gotta get this annual ring to start to turn. Yeah. Well, you can see these boards are getting more and more narrow out here. And that's why a rift only in a seven or eight inch is very, very difficult to get. Uh, because Interesting. You, start, you need to start with a much bigger log in order to maintain the width of the boards as you're cutting them off and get out here where the annual rings turn. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. I actually didn't know that. <laughs> Yeah, this, this year, to go back to your initial question, because I kind of went off on a tangent there. Yeah. But why is rifting quartered more stable than flat sawn or plain sawn? Uh -huh. So this is, a, this is basically how you uh, plain saw a log. You know, you, you cut it, you start just slicing it and turning it and cutting it. So, but your annual rings on your board here are going across the board. So when, the, when you shrink and contract with relative humidity, it's going to do it with the width of the board. So that's gotcha. why you get, you get uh, cupping, you get shrinkage more. If you go back to the rift and quarter, so the annual rings are vertical on the end of the uh -huh. board. So what this does is it swells and contracts with the thickness of the board. So you're not really losing width. Gotcha. So you're not getting those gaps between your floors. So people that, that want a solid floor but want a dimensionally stable product, you need, you know, rifting quarter is definitely a way to push them. Uh, gotcha. To, to maintain a little bit more stability. You get into engineered, it becomes a little less uh, of a, an issue because you've got the substrate to, to hold it, to keep it from moving as much. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, makes sense. I think... Uh, you're looking at something around, is it, correct me if I'm wrong, it's about half, like a white oak board that's ripped and quartered is gonna move uh, about half the distance sideways with the same moisture change somewhere in there? It's a general rule of thumb. I mean, it's, a lot of it comes down to how, how fast you stress it and, you know. Sure. Is it, is it happening constantly? You know, are people cranking their heat up and turning it down? You know, you can stress a floor to the point where it does things it may not normally do to. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I do want to touch on one thing you mentioned that that is interesting. So for a guy who, because uh, a lot of contractors are going to go out, they're going to look at a floor and they're um, going to say, oh, that board has fleck in it. It's quartered. That board is vertical grain with no fleck. That's rift um, is generally what I hear a lot of guys saying now. Um just touch on what you mentioned a minute ago, which is technically by the grading rules, if you order a hundred percent quartered floor, you're going to get a lot of fleck in there, but you can also, uh, did I understand right? You say you can also expect a decent amount of rift and then maybe vice versa, where if you ordered a hundred percent rift floor, you'll get some quartered in the floor as well. Cause there's an overlap on, um, the, the angle cut between the two. Yeah. You definitely got to educate your customer. Uh, on the grading rules, because that's probably one of the biggest, uh, I don't want to say complaint, because it's just a lack of education on the homeowner's part. So sure. it's, not really, it's not a valid complaint in a lot of ways. But yeah, when you, you, you want to go over the grading rules with them, on the on the quarter, like you said, 50% of the piece. So you have a 10-foot board, five feet of it have a fairly decent amount of heavy flecking, the other portion could just veer to the to the rift side or have some of that really small vertical flecking in it. Now on the, the, the opposite side of that, and, and we don't do too often get people complaining about the quartered content. It's on a quartered only, it's the rift only, where they, they, they you hear a lot of it, I want 100% rift floor. Well, the mm -hmm. rule is 75% of that, of each piece has to be, have rift characteristics. 
Gotcha. So on a 10 foot board, the last two and a half feet could slightly bend to a plane sawn. Yeah. Uh, it could have some quarter, some more heavy quarter fleck in it. And we typically try to exceed the grading rule if at all possible. And mm -hmm. it's more achievable in the narrow, th the two and a quarter, three, four. Once you hit the fives, it gets a little more difficult. Six and wider is, is where it, it gets really difficult to do a rift only floor because it's just, uh, it just takes such a, like you explained before, a massive log to, sure. yeah. to achieve that. Okay. But yeah, they definitely, in, in order to squash the complaint before it happens, uh, give them a visual of what it could be and, and okay. a, a verbal and or written explanation uh, yep. of what it is. So uh, I guess along with that, that's really good information um, for contractors because a lot of what a contractor should be doing with the customer is setting their expectations and talking through what, you know, what the floor is actually going to look like compared to what the customer is describing. Are there, um, you know, for like the super picky homeowners out there, do you guys run custom grades to a certain look? Like if somebody said, I have to have 90% fleck in this floor. Um, do you guys do that or do you stick mostly just within the, the standard grades? No, we've done it. Uh, you don't usually get the, the request on the quartered side of it as much as you do on the rift side of it. Uh, yeah. When you get that, uh, that more unique uh, linear look with a rift on, that's when I'll, I'll get people that'll say, hey, can I get a 90, 95%? And yeah, we've done a lot of those orders. Uh, we just need to know up front so we can price it accordingly. Uh, that affects your lead times. Uh, they still gotta take into account that we have our 5%, you know, Human human factor make a mistake, you know. So that that stuff's still going to be in there. Uh, but yeah, we we definitely have done. And there's a spec out there that we've done for years. It's mostly, mostly out of New York City, but it's a specific yep. species cut grade, no sap, rift only. And uh, it, yeah, so to the answer to your question, yes, we can we can mold it to what what the customer wants. And there's going to be sometimes you can't, like a 10 inch rift only, uh, six foot and longer, clear no sap. I wouldn't even begin to tell you how long something like that would take to do. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, so spent a lot of time on that. That's also uh, kind of your your guys' specialty. So um, we'll we'll move on from that and talk just a little bit about installation and some of the other things uh, as well. Um, so. In terms of acclimation on your products, um, I'm, I assume your solid products are, are just basic NWFA acclimation. So probably don't want to spend a lot of time on that. If guys have questions about that, we've actually done a video on uh, kind of the science and process to acclimate a solid floor um, that anybody can look up on YouTube. Um, for your engineered floor, how do you recommend that people acclimate that? Uh, usually, I mean, the engineered product is so stable and, you know, I usually try and give it like a 48 hours, 72 hours, just let everything get to temperature at least. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, moisture content and stuff related to that aren't as big of an issue because the veneer, the veneer on top is is not that in control. The plywood itself is in control. Uh, gotcha. So it's, it's not as crucial. I just always like to get, I'm actually getting ready to install the floors in the house I'm building and, uh, you know, I've got it in there. I'm going to give it 72, or 72 hours and I'm going to, because I want to get everything to temperature. Gotcha. What are the, uh, what are the conditions you want to see in that house before somebody starts installing the engineered product? Uh, I mean, you want to get your, one of the subfloor being within the NWFA guidelines is, is always super important. You want to make sure that's dried out to where it needs to be. Uh, your relative humidity, you want to get it in that 35 to 55 range, you know, and you want to hold it there uh, at the time of installation. And even more important, as the, uh, all the contractors know, is making sure that the homeowner knows that they got to keep it there after they move in and they're living there. Uh, sure. Trying to let it, you know, I document it when you leave the house, it was at 45%. You know, or it's at 55, you don't want them coming in and dropping it down to 35%. Right, so, right. But yeah, it's, 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 it, none of it's real rocket science. It's, 
it's, it's basically relative humidity and subfloor conditions are the things I look for the most. Yeah, gotcha. And I mean, the, the, there are specific rules, but the quick guidelines I typically give guys for a subfloor, regardless of the type is, is it clean? Is it dry? Is it flat? And is it structurally sound? Like right. basically, if you take all of those, you're good to go. Now, specific rules of flatness and you know, look, look forward to cleaning off all of that. Um, have specific numbers to it depending on the floor. But uh, do you guys recommend um, doing a glue assist on your floors? On the solid, I tend to start recommending that between once you get to five inch and wider. Definitely six inch and wider, depending on where you're at, your, your standard climbing condition. Uh, everywhere is a little bit different. But yeah, once once you hit the six inch and wider, I definitely recommend a glue assist on the solid. Uh, as far as the engineer goes, it's not a must, but I do recommend it for just the benefits of it. You know, it mm -hmm. keeps the floor from, from uh, moving as much. Uh, it helps with the noise, with any kind of kind of gives it a sound barrier to some extent uh it just it's just the in my opinion and is a proper way to install a floor yep. if at all possible money's always an issue and i know it's a little bit more expensive to go that route so but yes yep. the only place we say yes you need to do it is six inch and wider solid right right yeah and i mean like one of the things that that i talk about with guys a lot is hey it, it may not be required but um any manufacturer, not just Graph, that I know of or that I've dealt with is not going to warranty a product to not squeak or pop or make noises because those are right. almost always installation or job site related. So again, um, is it required? No. Uh, is it cheap insurance against a lot of callback problems that a homeowner is going to going to give you that you're not really going to have a good answer for? Um, you know, yes, your, your, your floor is squeaking and it's because uh, of the seasonal change in moisture, or it's because the subfloor was just out of tolerance in terms of evenness or, you know, things like that. So yeah. requi required, but certainly, uh, required maybe not, but certainly recommended for sure. Yeah, I would recommend it. So um, can you guys put, uh, I guess, either of your floors over radiant heat? Um, what do you tell guys with that? We warranty our engineered over radiant. Uh, as far as you can put the solid over, I don't. We don't really have a warranty set up for for unfinished solid over radiant heat because it's. I always recommend going engineered if you're going over radiant heat. If you are going to go with solid over radiant heat, I recommend going a little bit more narrow, and I recommend going rift and core. Gotcha. Uh, but okay. Yeah, the only one that we 100% warranty, well, I hate to say 100%, we warranty proper installation over radiant heat with engineered floors. Okay. Do you guys, because uh, I'm sure there are conditions that come along with that, do you guys publish those conditions on your website? Yeah, we have a downloads page on our, on our website, and you can get all the different installation instruction and warranties. You can get the... Uh, the content of like that's from out of high free, all the downloads are on our download page. Uh, especially if you're in a, if, if you have sensitivity to anything and you want to make sure that our products aren't going to uh, be an allergic reaction, which they won't, but it's all yep. been documented so that you can feel comfortable with it. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. And that's again, something that, um, you know, if you're going over a radiant heat system, I know you and I were talking the other day about it there are a lot of different systems and all of those systems uh, work differently. Some of them have hot spots, some of them don't, some of them are more even. Um, so certainly with that, you know, for guys, I'd certainly recommend being very careful about how you're bidding a radiant heat system. Make sure that you're looking up, especially on a graph floor. Hey, what, what does graph require? And then uh, I'm sure if anybody has any questions about that either, ask the distributor, ask you guys about it. Um, it's yeah, not we, something you want to find out after the fact that you missed one of the check boxes. Yeah, we run on our, uh, on our website, we have a live chat. Uh, and the girl that runs that, she's pretty knowledgeable. If it goes beyond what she's capable of, she'll typically give you one of our email addresses to help 
with any of the issues you made before you go into the installation. Yeah. Make you feel good about it. Awesome. Um, I guess the other question I had that you, you answered are, uh, you know, for solid floors, what kind of a condition would you maintain in the house after it's been installed? And the answer, um, I guess for any solid floor is typically the most consistent environmental conditions that, that you can maintain for your engineered floor. Um, can you just touch on again, the importance of telling a homeowner what the relative humidity needs to be in the house and watching the conditions of those houses, especially in the winter time? Yeah, this, this time, well, going into this time of year, we always joke because around January is when we'll start getting phone calls saying my, my floor cracked. Uh, and it's usually out of the, the Northeast portion of the country uh, because, you know, during there, they have much greater swings in relative humidity versus, you know, the lessening of it in the winter time. So you, you go in there, so we'll, an inspector will go in and, and, and check the, the relative humidity and they'll send back saying it's 17 percent yeah there's like your floor crack there's why yeah. it's checking uh so it's the importance is educating the customer up front in some some instances they may not be able to put the humidification system in their house on uh, you know as part of their heating and cooling but they need to understand the cheap little meters that you can sit on a countertop that says, hey, my brother's humidity is dropping. I'm going to stress my brand new expensive floor out that I love. So go get a humidifier and get, just get, just keep it maintained. Uh, you don't want to, I always tell us people, don't be the one that during the winter time to save a, a few extra bucks. And you're going to go out of town for a week on vacation. So you decide to turn your, uh, your temperature down to 65 degrees or 60 degrees to save a little bit of money yeah and, and then you stress the floor out while you're gone uh, yeah you come right back in and crank it back up uh, yeah yeah so, so that the, the most important things i think once a floor has been installed and you turn it over to the homeowner is is the relative humidity in the house they that's the only thing they really can monitor and then not damp mopping it of course but uh, you know, that's the one thing that they can kind of control to maintain a good flat surface on their floors. Right, right. And I mean, like you said earlier, the, the bottom end of that is 35%. And what I end up explaining to a lot of homeowners is it may be 35% relative humidity outside, maybe in the middle of winter time, and it's, but it's 20 degrees outside. So by the time you take 20 degree air at 35% outside and you heat that to 70 degrees inside. Now you're 10% relative humidity on the inside of the house. So, um, right. it, it definitely going into the heating season happens just instantly that that air just gets dry inside the house. So, um, well, I guess the, the last question I have real quick is, um, you know, if somebody was going to mess up any of your products, which contractors, uh, we all find a new and creative ways to do that over time. What are the easiest pitfalls that you would recommend guys avoid? Like what are some of the most common things that you get asked about that uh, you wish you could educate guys on before the fact? I think it kind of goes back to our initial portion of, the, of, of what we were talking about. The rules of rift versus border, those are hugely important. That's mm -hmm. probably one of the biggest calls I get was it wasn't rift enough, it wasn't quartered enough. Um, making your customer understand the link specifications uh, as far as a two, what to expect in a two to 10. They always say, well, how many 10 footers am I going to get? How many eight footers? Well, it's a nested bundle, so there's really no way to say exactly what that's going to be. But stress mm -hmm. the four foot average. Uh, if you're doing a three and longer, it's three to 10 with a five to six foot average. Uh, really nail down their expectations on that yeah. before you uh, receive the floor so that when they get there, the problem is, is when you do a three and longer, you stack up 10 bundles of three footers. It looks like so much is sitting there. The customer walks in and goes, oh, I got all three footers. Well, that three of those three foot bundles make up one nine foot bundle. 
So yeah, it doesn't look like you have much over there, but it still it still works out with the same square footage. That's sure. a, that's a big uh, big complaint for that we get. Once it's all said and done, the averages are usually always met and everything works out fine. But I would stress to them uh, that to avoid having to have a confrontation prior to you're at the point to install and now you got to put it on hold for a day or two to resolve an issue like that. Awesome. Awesome. All right, man. Well, um, appreciate you coming on. Appreciate you talking with us. I know um, I learned actually quite a bit in this. So thanks for all the info. Yep. I appreciate you having me on. Absolutely. All right. We'll talk to you all later. Have a good afternoon.